If your child needs help, don't delay. Children's Wisconsin is here, always. Hi, I'm Matt Daniels, director of the First Stage Young Company, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this presentation of our work for the high school competition at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. For over 10 years, YC has traveled to Cedar City, Utah every October to participate in the competition sponsored by the festival. This competition brings together over 3,000 like-minded students, mostly from the American West. Our team is the farthest flung, being from Wisconsin, and the only one east of the Mississippi River. This year, when the festival, like so many other theaters around the country, announced that there would be no productions, we were afraid that that would mean that there would be no competition, but the festival organizers had no such plans. The competition continues this year, virtually. All teams were invited to submit digital entries to share with nationwide judges. The theater competition is divided into three sections. Monologues, small scenes made up of duos or trios, and an ensemble scene, which has to have at least four actors and last up to ten minutes. Every year, we enter the most scenes allowed. Three monologues, a duo, a trio, and the ensemble scene. This year, since we would not be live, we were invited to explore the boundaries of the virtual medium. So, you will see a number of styles employed as we approached each scene. First up, a traditional audition-style staging of a monologue from Julius Caesar. In this scene from Act Two, Portia, confronts her husband Marcus Brutus, who has been emotionally distant as he has been secretly conspiring to assassinate Caesar. Nor for yours neither. You've ungently, Brutus, stole from my bed. And yesternight at supper you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across. And when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I urged you further, then you scratched your head, and too impatiently stamped with your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you answered not, but with an angry wafture of your hand gave sign for me to leave you. So I did, fearing to strengthen that impatience which seemed too much enkindled, and with all hoping it was but an effect of humor which sometime hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep. And could it work so much upon your shape as it hath much prevailed on your condition? I should not know you, Brutus. Dear, my lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humors of the dank morning. What, is Brutus sick, and will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No. My Brutus, you have some sick offense within your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. And upon my knees, I charm you by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love, and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one. But you unfold to me yourself, your half. Why you are heavy, and what men tonight have had resort to you, for here have been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from darkness. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself, but as it were in sort or limitation? 
to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Brutus's harlot, not his wife. In this next scene from Henry VI, Part I, Joan La Pucelle, better known as Joan of Arc, has been captured by the English forces in France. She is being transported from the Duke of York's camp to be burned at the stake when they are interrupted by her father, an old shepherd. Bring forth that sorceress condemned to burn. Ah, oh, Joan, this kills thy father's heart outright. Have I sought every country far and near, and now it is my chance to find me out? Must I behold thy timeless, cruel death? Oh, Joan, sweet daughter Joan, I'll die with thee! Decrepit miser, base ignoble wretch, I am descended of a gentler blood. Thou art no father nor no friend of mine. Out, out! My lord's end, please you! Tis not so. I did beget her, all the parish knows. Her mother liveth yet, can testify she was the first fruit of my bachelorship. Graceless, wilt thou deny thy parentage? This argues what her kind of life hath been, wicked and vile, and so her death concludes. Fie, Joe, that thou wilt be so obstacle. God knows that thou art a call of my flesh. And for thy sake, I have shed many a tear. Deny me not, I prithee, sweet daughter Joan. Peasant of vaunt, you have suborned this man, of purpose to obscure my noble birth. Tis true, I gave a noble to the priest the morn I was wedded to her mother. Kneel down and take my blessing, good my girl. Wilt thou not stoop? Thou cursed be the time of thy nativity. I would the milk thy mother gave thee when thou suckst her breath, had a little grasping for thy sake. Or else, when thou didst keep my lands afield, I would some ravenous wolf had eaten thee. Dost thou deny thy father, cursed drab? Oh. Burn her. Burn her. Hanging is too good! Take her away, for she hath lived too long to fill the world with vicious qualities. First, let me tell you whom you have condemned. Not one begotten of a shepherd swain, but issued from the progeny of kings, virtuous and holy, chosen from above by inspiration of celestial grace to work exceeding miracles on earth. I never had to do with wicked spirits, but you that are polluted with your lusts, stained with the guiltless blood of innocence, corrupt and tainted with a thousand vices, because you want the grace that others have, you judge it straight a thing impossible to compass wonders but by help of devils. No, misconceived. Joan of Arc hath been a virgin from her tender infancy, chaste and immaculate in very thought, whose maiden blood thus rigorously effused, will cry for vengeance at the gates of heaven. Aye, aye. And hark you, sirs, because she is a maid, spare for no bundles. Let there be a now. Place barrels a pitch upon her fatal stake, so that her torture may be shortened. Will nothing turn your unrelenting heart? Then, Joan, discover thine infirmity that warranteth by law to be thy privilege. I am with child, you bloody homicide. Murder not then the fruit within my womb, although you hail me to a violent death. Now, heaven forfend the holy maid with child. The greatest miracle that e'er you wrought. Is all your strict preciseness come to this? Well, go to. We'll have no bastards live especially since Charles must father it. You are deceived. My child is none of his. It was a Lanson that enjoyed my love. A Lanson, that notorious Machiavel. It dies, and it had a thousand lies. Oh, give me leave. I have deluded you. T'was neither Charles nor yet the Duke I named, but 
Renier, king of Naples, that prevailed. Why, here's a girl. I think she knows not well. There were so many whom she may accuse. Strumpet, thy words condemn thy brat and thee. Use no entreaty, for it is in vain. Then lead me hence, with whom I leave my curse. May never glorious sun reflect his beams upon the country where you make abode. But darkness and the gloomy shade of death environ you, till mischief and despair drive you to break your necks or hang yourselves. In this scene from Romeo and Juliet, Juliet contemplates the repercussions of Friar Lawrence's plan to reunite the young lovers by giving her a sleeping potion to feign death. <laughs> Farewell. <laughs> God knows when we shall meet again. I have a faint cold fear thrills through my veins that almost freezes up the heat of life. I'll call them back again to comfort me. Nurse! What should she do here? In my dismal scene, I needs must act alone. Become vile. <laughs> What if this mixture do not work at all? Shall I be married then tomorrow morning? No, no. This shall forbid it. Let other. What if it be a poison which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead? lest in this marriage he should be dishonored because he married me before to Romeo. I fear it is. And yet, methinks it should not, for he has still been tried a holy man. How if, when I am laid into the tomb, I wake before the time that Romeo come to redeem me? There's a fearful point. Shall I not then be stifled in the vault whose foul mouth no healthsome air breathes in and there die, strangled, ere my Romeo comes? Or if I live, is it not very like the horrible conceit of death and night together in the place as in a vault? An ancient receptacle where for these many hundred years the bones of all my buried ancestors are packed where bloody Tybalt, yet but green in earth lies festering in his shroud, where, as they say, at some hours of the night spirits resort. Alack, alack, is it not like that I so early waking, what with loathsome smells and shrieks like mandrakes torn out of the earth, that living mortals hearing them run mad? Oh, if I wake, Shall I not be distraught, environed with all these hideous fears, and madly play with my forefather's joints, and pluck the mangled Tybalt from his shroud? And in this rage, with some great kinsman's bone, as with a club, dash out my desperate brains. <laughs> Thinks I see my cousin's ghost seeking out Romeo that did spit his body upon a rapier's point. Stay, Tybalt, stay! Romeo! Romeo. Romeo, here's drink. This do I drink to thee. In Much Ado About Nothing, Beatrice and Benedict have a will-they-won't-they they relationship which is now imperiled. Benedict's friend Claudio just humiliated his fiance hero, who happens to be Beatrice's cousin, and left her at the altar. In this scene, Benedict approaches Beatrice to give her a little comfort in the aftermath of this disastrous wedding. Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Yea, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. 
You have no reason. I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin is wronged. <sighs> How much might the man deserve of me that would right her? Is there any way to show such friendship? A very even way. No such friend. May a man do it? <laughs> it is a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? As strange as the thing I know not. The worst possible for me to say I love nothing so well as you. But believe me not. And yet I lie not. I confess nothing nor I deny nothing. I'm sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me, and make him eat it that says I love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no sauce that can be devised to it. I protest. I love thee. Why then, God forgive me. What offense, sweet Beatrice. You have stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest I loved you. Man, do it with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart, there is none left to protest. Um, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. <sighs> Not for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Oh, Terry. Sweet Beatrice. I am gone, though I am here. There is no love in you. Nay, I will go. Beatrice. In faith, I will go. We'll be friends first. You dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy. Is Claudio thine enemy? Is he not approved in the height of villain that has slandered, scorned, dishonored my kinswoman? <gasps> that I were a man. What? Bear her in hand until they come to take hands, and then with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor, oh, that I were a man. I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Nay, but Beatrice. Talk with a man out in a window, a proper saying. I hear me, Beatrice. Sweet hero, she is wronged, she is slandered, she is undone. Beatrice. Princes and counties, surely a princely testimony, a goodly count, count Comfet. A sweet gallant, surely, <laughs> that I were a man for his sake. That I had any friend would be a man for my sake. But manhood is melted into curtsies, valor into compliment, and men are turned only into tongue, and trim ones too. He is now as valiant as Hercules, that only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing, for I will die a woman with grieving. A very good Beatrice. By this hand, I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you in your soul that the Count Claudio hath the wrong Tiro? Yea, as sure as I have a thought or a soul. Enough. I am engaged. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. Go comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead. And so farewell. Margaret is no longer Queen of England now that her husband and son have been killed and the monarchy has been usurped in the War of the Roses. In this scene from Richard III, Margaret confronts those who were responsible for her family's murder and have reaped the benefits. What? Were you snarling all before I came, ready to catch each other by the throat and turn you all your hatred now on me? Did York's dread curse prevail so much with heaven that Henry's death, my lovely Edward's death, their kingdom's loss, my woeful banishment, should all but answer for that thievish friend? Can curses pierce the clouds and enter heaven? Why then give way, dull clouds, to my quick curses? Though not by war, 
By surfeit die your king, as ours by murder to make him a king. Edward thy son, that now is Prince of Wales, for Edward our son, that was Prince of Wales, die in his youth by like untimely violence. Thyself a queen, for me that was a queen, outlive thy glory like my wretched self. Long mayest thou live to wail thy children's death, and see another as I see thee now, decked in thy rights, as thou art stalled in mine. Long die thy happy days before thy death, and after many lengthened hours of grief, die neither mother, wife, nor England's queen. Rivers and Dorset, ye were standers by, and so wast thou, Lord Hastings, when my son was stabbed with bloody daggers. God, I pray him that none of you may live his natural age, but by some unlooked accident cut off. Stay, dog, for thou shalt hear me. If heaven have any grievous plague in store, Exceeding those that I can wish on thee, oh, oh, let them keep it, till my sins be ripe, and then hurl their indignation down on thee, the troubler of the world's peace. The worm of conscience still benaw thy soul. Thy friends suspect for traitors while thou livest, and take deep traitors for thy dearest friends. No sleep. Close up that deadly eye of thine, unless it be, while some tormenting dream affrights thee with a hell of ugly devils, thou! Elvis marked, abortive, rooting hog! How then was sealed in thy nativity, the slave of nature and the son of hell! The slander of thy heavy mother's womb, thou loathed issue of thy father's loins, thou rag of honor! Thou detested Richard! The ensemble scene is often presented by competition goers as one of the big group scenes in a Shakespeare play, an opening throne room moment, or a trial scene, or a reconciliation from Act Five. A few years ago, young company started exploring these scenes from a different angle by looking through all of Shakespeare's works to play on variations of a particular theme. Past topics have included storms and dreams and witchcraft. This year, we decided to tackle isolation and ostracization. This medley is called My Outcast State and was captured in a single take via a Zoom live stream. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live onto the world. And for because the world is populous and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain will prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts. There's no more to be said, except he is banished, his enemy to the people and his country. Shall be so. I heard my soul proclaim, and by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place, a guard. And the most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Oh, whilst I'm escaped, I must preserve myself. My face shall grime with filth, a bl blanket my loins, off all my hair in knots. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars. Poor Charlie God, poor Tom. That's something yet. It's Edgar, I nothing am. And trouble death heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself, and curse my fate. Thy fault our law calls death, but the kind prince taking thy part hath rushed aside the law, and turned that black word death to banishment. This is dear mercy, and thou seest it not. Tis torture and not mercy. Heaven is here where Juliet lives, and every cat and dog and little mouse, every unworthy thing live here in heaven and may look on her. But Romeo may not. 
more validity, more honorable state, more courtship lives in carrion flies than Romeo. They may seize on the white wonder of dear Juliet's hand and steal a mortal blessing from her lips, but Romeo may not. He is banished. And sayest thou yet that exile is not death? Wishing me like to one more rich in hope? My second joy and first fruits of my body, from his presence I am barred, like one infectious. My third comfort starred most unluckily is from my breast the innocent milk in its most innocent man paled out to murder. Myself on every post proclaimed as strumpet with a modest hatred the childbed privilege denied which wants to women of all fashion. Lastly, hurried here to this place in the open air before I have got strength of limit. Now, my liege, tell me what blessings I have here alive that I should fear to die. Featured like him, like him with friends possessed. He hath disgraced me and scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands? Organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapon, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? Desiring this man's art and that man's scope. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I'm some 12 or 14 moonshines lag of a brother? Why bastard? Wherefore base, when my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous, and my shape as true as honest madam's issue? Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base? Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now gods, stand up for bastards. With what I most enjoy contented least. You common cry of curse, whose breath I hate is reek of the rotten fens, whose loves I prize is the dead, carcasses of unburied men that do corrupt my air, I banish you, your enemies, with nodding of their plumes, fan you into despair. Have the power still to banish your defenders till at length your ignorance, which finds not till it feels, making but reservation of yourselves till your own foes deliver you, as most abated captives to some nation that won you without blows, despising for you the city thus. I turn my back. There is a world elsewhere. Thus play I in one person many people, and none contented. Sometimes am I a king, and treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. They eat more in our country than they do in their own. Penny loaf a day, Troy, wait. They bring in strange roots for what's a sorry parsnip to a good heart. Trash, trash, they breed sore eyes, and is enough to infect the city with palsy. Nay, it has infected it with the palsy. For these bastards of dung, as you know, they grow in dung, have infected us. And it is our infection will make the city shake, which partly comes to the eating of parsnips. True, and pumpkins together. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then am I kinged again. What say ye to the mercy of the king? Do ye refuse it? No, Mary, do we not? 
we accept of the king's mercy, but we will show no mercy upon the strangers. I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising. You'll put down strangers, kill them, cut their throats, possess their houses, and lead the majesty of law in line to slip him like a hound. Say now the king, should so much come to short of your great trespass as but to banish you, whither would you go? What country, by the nature of your error, should give you harbor? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province, to Spain or Portugal? Why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth? Wet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs. What would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case. And this, your mountainish inhumanity. Haply, I think on thee. For her own sake, it beggared all description. She did lie there in the pavilion, cloth of gold, of tissue, or picturing that fancy outwork nature. Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. And then my state. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile this day shall gentle his condition. Like to the lark at break of day arising. In nature there is no blemish but the mind. None can be called deformed but the unkind. From sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculties and form and moving. How express and admirable in action. How like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Oh, wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. <laughs> Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for our presentation of this work submitted to the Utah Shakespeare Festival High School competition. Although our team tends to score well with the judges every year, as I sit down to record this, I don't yet know how they fared. This matters not. For young company students, the work is its own reward. And although we were not able to travel to Utah to share it this year, these students were ecstatic to still have the opportunity to participate. I hope you'll consider supporting future work by joining us for our performance project of one of Shakespeare's earliest plays, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, a wonderful comedy to be presented later this fall.